الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الوقتة من لساني يفضل قولي إن شاء الله في هذه الحلقة سنتحدث عن سورة العلق هذه هي أول سورة التي كانت أول خمس ورسات هذا الشابتر هي أول ورسات التي كانت أول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and um, as I talked about last uh, week as well, uh, some of the books that uh, I will be using inshallah are these books uh, that I go back to for kind of a prepping for this, uh, uh, this lecture. And uh, if uh, you guys are interested in going back to the resources, these are some of the books and of course, besides that, you always go back to the Quran and the Ahadith books also as well. To, to look into the details of uh, those ahadith which are mentioned in these uh, seerah books. And actually, I've mentioned two of the seerah books as well. One of them is the Seerah Nectar or Al-Hikul Mahtum. It's a good book for uh, seerah. I, I highly recommend for you, brothers and sisters, to uh, look into that. That will help you uh, to have some sort of a chronological order of the events that happen. And this is one reason that we are going, uh, when we are talking about the seerah session as well, we're trying to go in the order of the revelation of the Quran, so hopefully that will help us to also get a better picture of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam along with it. So, uh, as I mentioned, the books we're using is Tafsir Nasafi uh, and uh, Ibn Kathir, Fidr uh, al-Quran by Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah, and Al-Jam al-Ahkam by Qurtubi, Tafhim al-Quran by Mawdudi, and also by Mawardi. And the seerah books I mentioned are Seerah Nectar and uh, uh, Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham is one of the uh, classical ones, and that actually goes back to Ibn Ishaq also. There's are two Sira books. Uh, Sira means a biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And whenever I use this word, Sira means that uh, we're referring to Sira of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Even though Sira can be of anybody else, else as well. And when I'm using the term Tafsir, Tafsir is the Tafsir of the Quran or the commentary of the Quran that we are talking about. Okay. So uh, and uh, if uh, I am using any other terminologies or something. Uh, please, uh, uh, and I don't translate by by slip of a tongue or something. Do let me know, and I'll try to translate, inshallah. Okay. Now, this is the the first forty surahs, uh, verses that were revealed to Rasulullah Sallam in the order of revelation. Okay. So we know that the Quran. When we open the Mus'haf or the copy of the Quran, it starts with Surah Fatiha, then goes to Surah Baqarah, then goes to Surah Al Imran, and and so on and so forth. So uh, I just mentioned the first forty, and then we'll see how many we can cover here. In this semester, but uh, we'll, we'll cover as much as we can, inshallah. Uh, but uh, that kind of give you an idea of uh, this, the, the, the order of revelation as well. So, the first surah was with Alaq, and this is what we are, inshallah, starting off with. Um, <clears throat> but before we go to talk about Surah Al Alaq, or the first revelation that happened to Rasulullah, it is, it is of uh, utmost importance for us to understand that in which circumstances that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is how we will understand even. Look, if we understand the, uh, the circumstances, Rasulullah was appointed as the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how those circumstances changed from the abyss of jahiliyyah or ignorance that they were living in, and how they came out to be the one, became the beacon of light for the mankind. Not only for the Meccans, not only for the Arabian Peninsula, not only for the Arab, or they, they, they became the beacon of light for the whole mankind. As Allah Azza wa has referred to Islam as a nur, the light of Allah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. Now, uh, so for that, I, I will try my best to uh, go uh, quickly on the background of the circumstances that Rasulullah was sent as the Messenger of Allah. And this is one of the things that is important for us even to. Uh, when we uh, understand, when we go to tafsir or the commentary of the Quran, one of the key things, or many, many others, by the way, not to say this is the only one, but to know the cause of revelation also, right? So now here we're talking about the cause of revelation, just uh, as a whole. Muhammad Sallallahu was sent into uh, Arabian Peninsula. Uh, why was he sent as a messenger of Allah? So we can get it by understanding the circumstances. When it comes to the location of the Arabs, because uh, the area which is called today Saudi Arabia, it was always referred as Arabia or, 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 or Jazeera al okay? So it was the Jazeera al and always the people who lived there were referred as the Arab, as, as far as we know historically, yeah? Now, 
Linguistically, Arab means uh, desert and uh, waste barren and uh, well nigh waterless, treeless. This is the kind of area, uh, this is the desert Arab. This was not uh, the way we see it today as the oil is coming out of it and the gold and all those mines that have been found, so that the whole world is going crazy about that region. Uh, but it was a very barren land. Yeah? Now, uh, when it comes to the location of it, so this is kind of a, from the past, as you can see, that the, which is referred to the Arabia over there, you can see on the left side is the Red Sea, on the right side you can see uh, the Arabian Sea and, and, and the Persian Gulf. On the on the top right you see of the Arabian, uh, this is what I'm referring to as Arabia, of course. And uh, here you see Persia, this is the Persian Empire, and on the left you will see the uh, Byzantine Empire or, or the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, different areas of the world at that time were under these main two empires. And of course, there was uh, other parts of the world as well, which were not under these two empires, but they were the one referred as the superpowers of that time. Okay, um, now uh, because it is, it was a barren land, but uh, by the same time, it has a very strategic location. And uh, nowadays, probably you guys are hearing it about all this thing about how Houthis are attacking the, 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 the ships and stuff. So now you can see why it is so important if you look at the map. That this is the, the Red Sea is the area where all these uh, ships are going through to, to take the goods to the, the, to, to the main places where people really live. And if they really have to go to Europe or something, if they don't go through the, the Red Sea or these areas, uh, and another part of that is connected to a Suez Canal, uh, uh, then otherwise they have to make a huge circle to uh, take the shipment from one of these areas. Hence, these, the, this area, from the maritime perspective, also is one of the key uh, areas for the world as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, create, uh, pick this place, which is uh, Jaziratul Arab, and I'm gonna continue to use the term Jaziratul Arab rather than to call it Saudiya or these kind of places. Maybe I'll use it by slip of a tongue, but in general, it's Jaziratul Arab, yeah? Uh, which is, uh, Jazira means, uh, in this case, even though Jazira can mean island also, but here it means uh, peninsula. So this is the Arabian Peninsula we are talking about. And we know the peninsula means something which is uh, all sides you have water except one side is attached to land, yeah? Um, okay. Um, so uh, nowadays you see the very same map like this, right? So you see that Saudi Arabia is there, or Yemen is there, Ethiopia is there, Somalia is there, Eritrea is there. Actually, I was just coming down here and the, 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 the cab driver, he's from Eritrea, I was just talking to him about the, the situation between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, this is sad, the, the way things are, but this is the way it is, the, the way the world has been divided by nation state uh, borders and things like that. Okay, so this is the current thing you can see, and uh, but you can see the uh, importance of the location perspective, yeah? Uh, uh, even though it was very important, uh, very uh, uh, strategically local, uh, location-wise, it's a very important place. But because of being barren, because of, uh, uh, there was no water, there was no trees in the area in general, it was kind of a protected that nobody wanted to really invade or take over this land. But people were still living there, there were tribes there. Uh, so even though there were two superpowers were there, but they were not really interested in that. As one of the reports talked about, even when Alexander was passing by, he didn't want to stop by and say it. It's, he looked at it, look, these people fight with each other, and this is barren land, what are you going to do it? So he, he just continued on and did not even want to bother to stop there. Okay, now so that's the location. Now when it comes to the, the, the uh, Arab tribes, uh, Arab tribes can be divided into three different kinds of tribes. We're talking about still Jazeera to Arab, Arabian Peninsula. Uh, those who are, one is called Arab Baida. Arab Baida are the ones who are gone, basically. So we're talking about uh, the Tamud and the Aal and, 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 and Mlaq and other, uh, other tribes that used to exist, but they were Arab, but they are gone. Second one is Arab al Arab. Arab al Arab means these are the pure Arabs. And in general, they're referred to as uh, Qahtani Arabs. Or uh, uh, even in today, when we say that Yemen is one of those areas where you find the area that pure Arabs are coming from. Or even Jazeera al Arab has some as well who move from back and forth. But these are the ones who are the, well, referred as Arab al Arab or pure Arabs. Third one is the Arabic Arab, which is called Arab al Mustarab. Arab al Mustarab, when we say that it means somebody who was from the perspective of not from the originally pure, you know, always being Arab or something, but rather they were, came from different areas, migrated here, and then they adopted the, adopted the Arabic language, they became part of the area, and they referred as they are Arabized Arab. And by the way, Rasulullah, if you 
thing from the perspective of the lineage he himself was comes in the third category. Because he was from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam. And Ismail alayhi salam, whose father was Ibrahim, we know that, that he came from the area of the Iraq, and they, their language was not Arabic at that time. Uh, so they, uh, from lineage perspective, you can see because Rasulullah was from uh, uh, Ismail alayhi salam's lineage, uh, so he was from the category of al Arab al So I talked about that, I'll skip that. Um, okay. Now, Besides that, to understand, we have to understand that, okay, what kind of a social life people were living at that time? And uh, it's kind of a sum up, uh, uh, another hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam summed it up from Aisha uh, what, kind of a, uh, what kind of life, uh, social life it was there. But besides that, uh, they did have some of the sicknesses you find that uh, they used to bathe their daughters alive. Not all of them, obviously, but they were quite a few who were burying their daughters alive because for them, there was kind of a, their faces would turn black that they have a the birth of a daughter have been uh, mentioned to them. But at the same time, there were women like Khadija radiallahu anha, we find that who was a very successful businesswoman and uh, people, uh, uh, after she became a widow, people wanted, there were many people who wanted to marry Khadija radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But uh, she, she did not marry anyone after she was widowed except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, she's the one who sent a proposal through somebody to, to marry Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it was, uh, it was accepted and we know the rest of the story. Uh, so that's uh, another aspect of uh, social life. But this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually, uh, this is what happened here, right? So because of uh, the things are kind of moved. Uh, uh, this hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha mentions about the kind of marriages that existed in the time prior to Islam. The first one is the one that was uh, uh, kept by Islam as the legal way of getting married, which is uh, a person who will be proposed and there's an ijab of qubul, meaning uh, uh, offering acceptance in the presence of the wali, which is the guardian of the, of the girl and uh, the witnesses and all those things. This, this is the marriage that was there and that was accepted by Islam and then uh, but uh, 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 and it was in the jahiliya as well, the days of ignorance. So jahiliya, in another term, you will be hearing me using it. Jahiliya means the time prior to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uh, uh, advent, being a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa taala. That those days when Islam was not there, that those days are referred as the days of ignorance, the days of dark ages, if you want to call them, or the days uh, of without Islam. Uh, and the second kind of marriage was it's a very um, uh, a strange and uh, nasty kind of a way of marriage that they, they, they had. And that shows their social ills that, they, that existed at that time. A man would send his wife to somebody who was of a higher status or belonged to a higher uh, family or tribe, so she would sleep with him, so she gets pregnant by him, so they will have some uh, higher tribe's blood in their lineage. Okay, so the wife, uh, he, he, they would, he, the person would send his wife while she is after going through the, the, the time of Hayd or the uh, uh, which is the monthly period, and then uh, uh, when she's uh, she, after that, he has not slept with her. He will send send her to sleep with somebody else, as I mentioned, from a higher tribe or higher lineage, and continue to be with him until she gets pregnant. Of course, Islam rejected this kind of a marriage, and the third kind of a marriage. Worse than that even. A woman is sleeping with about 10 guys and then she gets pregnant and then she would just put the hand on the one that she thinks is the father and he has no way to say he's the father or not. He, he has accepted and now he's the father and the lineage continues on. Fourth one, it gets worse and worse. So this woman would, marry, would be sleeping with more than 10 guys. Okay, so whenever she's available she put the flag up and people are going to, 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 to her uh, place and and if he gets pregnant, she used to get pregnant, then they used to bring uh, a kahina, kahina or kahin, a person who would, by, by looking at the traits of the child, would decide who's the father. Okay? And once uh, the, 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 the he or she will decide, it's done. And uh, subhanAllah, I, whenever I talk about this, I always remember so, something which is um, very unfortunate that we can see that in today's time as well, these kind of things happen. That uh, the jahiliya, the ignorance, uh, always repeats itself, uh, no matter uh, 
what time uh, we are talking about, what era we are talking about. And the very same kind of sicknesses we see today as well. Uh, there are shows which are uh, uh, nasty shows they, they show on TV. Where they, <clears throat> they'll bring a woman or a man who was sleeping with many, many different partners. And then they will say, okay, let's see the DNA test. And they will open up the envelopes and uh, decide who the father is. And subhanAllah, it's so sickening. Sometimes uh, uh, one of my friends, he mentioned to me the story, he said, I know I don't watch these kind of shows, but he mentioned me a story, I'm just repeating that story, what, what I heard. So the, a woman came with multiple guys, and they were all fighting who the father is, uh, who's not the father, whatever. And then they opened the DNA test, and none of them were the father. So there was somebody else besides the one that listed a bunch of people who were there. And the, 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 okay, that might find funny and all those things, but the thing is, the reason I am bringing this up is to show the comparison. Look, when Islam is not present, that the Jahiliya is continuously repeating. Maybe uh, uh, in a different way of, okay, we have done the, some material progress has been done, but the actions are similar, it's not much different. So it's, it's the same kind of social sicknesses that we are seeing today as well uh, in the world at large. So only, uh, as a hadith mentioned, the Rasulullah only marriage that allowed was the one which was the first one that mentioned, and Islam continued on with that. Okay. Now it comes to religions in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula. In general, at the time when Rasulullah came as a prophet or appointed as a prophet, most of the people were polytheists, mushrikeen, but still they had Judaism was there, Christianity was there, and Magianism, which is Majus, uh, uh, fire worshippers. Uh, and, and, and Sabianism. Sabianism has multiple meanings been mentioned. Sabianism are also referred to the people who worship stars. Some people uh, refer to them as, well, they did believe in the Day of Judgment uh, 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 and believe in, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of them say that uh, Sabi, in Arabic they use the term, or uh, um, uh, they, the Arabs they used to use this term for anybody who left the uh, shirk, idol worshipping. They will start going, oh, he has become a Sahabi. Okay? So that's the point of mentioning this is. So we understand when Islam came, it's not that Arabs, uh, they rejected anybody who's not polytheist. They, they, they were just going crazy about that. The, all these religions existed, but Islam came, something different happened now. They could not, they could not accept that the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam would continue to call for this message. Uh, and uh, people start going into full Islam because they realize that this is different than all these religions that were mentioned. It is a way of life that Muhammad Sallallahu brought and that people uh, have to change their life and many of the people who were the, uh, who, 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 who were the movers and the shakers of the society, they realize that their, uh, uh, their position is at stake. Hence, they oppose Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when you talk about religions, how did they start? People were actually following Ismail al salams deen that was given to Ismail al salam He was the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then how, uh, how come these people start worshipping idols? idols? So Amr bin Luhayy was one of the prominent leaders. He was referred as a scholar, leader, whatsoever. A, a person who would say something, people follow it. Okay? So he went to Sham. Uh, or today, Bilad al-Sham means, uh, what's the term that they use? Levan? Levant, right? Yeah. So, uh, okay, so Sham referred to the areas which is where the, today's Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. They're all together was referred to that. So Sham, whenever the, the, is, is, is been used in the Ahadith, they're referring to the whole region, not just today's Syria is the Sham. Okay? Now, so he went to Sham, he saw people are worshipping uh, uh, idols, and he thought, oh, this is cool, this is something good. Let me bring it back to an uh, idol, back to uh, uh, Mecca. And he brought Hubal, one of the the gods that they start for, or one of the false god of uh, on an idol they started worshiping. He brought him in, and not necessarily he was saying, "Oh, this is a god of all worship." It was more of a started off like this that, "Oh, this is gonna bring you closer to to God." So this is why you start worshiping the idols. Uh, so Allah they believed in, but at the same time they said, "Oh, this partners with Allah, you have to go through these partners." Now, so uh, the the reason to understand is why people would even accept idol worshiping like that, right? Um, and that's a key thing to remember from this also that, look, um, he was a person who people admired. They, they liked him. So hence, when he says something, they did accept it. So that can happen in today's time too. 
Like for example, if a, if a scholar says something uh, which is not from Islam, just because a scholar is saying that, or a person who has some power, or a person who has whatever kind of power, intellectual power or material power, if he says something and people start following them blindly, they can go in the wrong direction as well, right? So it's the same thing. We have to remember when you read these stories, the purpose of that is to get the lessons out of it. So we don't follow the same mistakes that the people have followed in the past, right? So we don't, uh, this is the purpose in general. Allah Azza wa Jal has uh, told us that uh, uh, when it comes to the stories of the past, it is for the ibra, for the lesson to learn from, and this is what we gain from there as well. Economic situation, as I already mentioned, it was a, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the land that was barren, you know, general not much water, not much trees. Uh, it was not like a trade, it, it was not much of a place to produce something. Rather they were doing more trade. Okay, so they were engaged in trade, take the stuff from one place to another place. In general, two main routes were go to Sham, which is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the area of, I mentioned as the one, and uh, or go towards Yemen. So uh, in the winter time, they used to go to Yemen, down south, in the north, which is the Sham, they used to go in the summertime. Um, Okay, now, so this is the trade was made of thing, but it's still, the area had a lot of poverty, hunger, insufficient uh, clothing was, this was a common thing for Jazeera This is why you hear the statements like that when Rustam, one of the generals of the Persian army, when Muslims were going to fight in the time of Muhammad Khattab, he tried to say, well, I don't want to fight these people. He said, these people have not enough to cover themselves with the clothes, they don't have enough to eat. He even said, often like this, he will give, a clothing and, and some food or money or something for each soldier. Go back. This is how he was treating the, the, the army that was sent by Umar al-Khattab. And they are the one who defeated him there, uh, later on. But uh, that, that was a, the situation of uh, the area at that time. Now, another problem that, that those days when Rasulullah was appointed as a prophet and then the Surah al was revealed to Rasulullah was tribal rivalry that existed among them. There was tribalism was at the uh, at the peak, I mean, they would fight with each other for silly, silly things to a point that oh, you 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 camel uh, 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 graze at the, uh, at the at the wrong area, and then they would be fighting for decades for that stupid, silly thing. Uh, or the race happened, and the and the race was won by somebody who was from a lower tribe or something, or uh, and so on and so forth. And they had a uh, uh, they had a strange kind of understanding about supporting your tribe was like this. Support your brother whether he is an oppressor or oppressed. We, we, we know that. Uh, uh, there's a hadith of Rasulullah that talks like this also. On Surah Khaqa, the Dalim or Madluma. That uh, help your brother whether he's a Dalim or Madlum. And Sahaba asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we understand that when a brother is a Dalim or, uh, uh, or a Madlum, sorry, the one who's oppressed, how to help him? Go and help him because he's getting, getting, being oppressed. How do you help the one who is the dhalim, the oppressor himself? So Rasulullah said, holding his hand so he does not do the act of aggression. That is mean by helping your brother. Now, they literally used to follow this as is. Your brother is the oppressor or oppressed, you gotta help him because he's, he's from your tribe. So he's oppressor, go help him to oppress. And look at the jahiliya today. Isn't that the very same thing that's happening in the world? It's a, in the name of different things, not, it doesn't seem like a tribalism or something, but it is different kind of a group of people who are just helping each other as long as the benefit for them lines up with them, then they will, if it takes oppression, they'll go oppress. No, no matter what. And that's exactly what's happening in the world as well. When you take Islam out, when you take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the lives of the people, the results are the same as the jahiliya that we saw prior to that as well. Okay? So again, I'm repeating this sentence again, so you don't get confused why Abu Asim is talking about this stuff here. Because the point is, we have to understand why the Wahi came, what circumstances the Wahi came, and how Rasulullah was able to change the circumstances. Okay? Now, ethics. Okay, so we said lots of bad things about the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Even with, with all those bad things, they have some of the very good things still in, in, in them, which is part of the ethics they had. For example, hospitality. Hospi hospitality. Uh, keeping a covenant or a sense of honor and reputation of injustice, right? Uh, uh, and inshallah, we'll talk about that as well more. Uh, for, uh, firm will and determination, forbearance, perse perseverance, mildness, and pure and simple Bedouin life. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the area kind of a, uh, uh, safe from many of the uh, civilization, what they were doing out there, from that they, they still have continued to have a very pure and simple life there. Okay, as you, I mean, as we know, Rasulullah and the, and the kids in the, in those days 
children used to be sent to the, uh, we call those uh, Bedouin lifestyle, or to the villages or countryside. They lived there because even those that used to think, oh, the air is better over there. Or they would learn the language better over there. So this is why they used to send them, and Rasulullah so was sent as well as a child. Now, now let's go back to the surah that was revealed to Rasulullah so or the first five verses that were revealed to Rasulullah so in, uh, the, the, and this is like a jamhur, majority of the scholars agree on, that the verses that were revealed to Rasulullah so the first verses were from Surah Alaq, and these are the first five verses. These are the verses that were revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the first time that Angel Jibreel came to him and gave these verses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so now, as I said, so what happened when these verses were revealed? What, what were the circumstances? So there's a hadith, and there are many hadith on the subject of this revelation. Ibn Kathir uses it, and many of the Mufassirin uses this hadith specifically when they talk about the first revelation was sent to Rasulullah Sallallahu So now keep that in mind, what kind of a lifestyle was going on in those days, and Rasulullah Sallallahu was appointed as a prophet. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi we know that he was referred as a Sadiq al yeah? the truthful one and the honest one. He is the one who is referred as the one uh, uh, who actually, in the days of Jahiliyyah, even though he was not a prophet, he already never worshipped idols. And he was not the only one. There were many other Sahaba, uh, uh, became Sahaba later on, or many other people in Mecca who did not worship uh, idols either. Bakr Siddiq was one of them. Uh, uh, Uthman bin Affan was another one. Zayd bin uh, uh, Amr bin Nufel was another one. And, and so on and so forth. And we will talk about uh, a few of them today's talk later, inshallah, as well. So when this verse was revealed, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that uh, uh, this revelation, the commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's, to Allah's messenger was in the form of good dream. In the beginning, so Allah used to see a dream, in the, and, uh, and this is talking about six months prior to the revelation. Okay? And, uh, and though that good dream will turn to be a uh, uh, something which is like a, in the day night, uh, during the day light time, he will see that happening. Okay, so whatever he sees in the dream, he sees that turns out to be a fact or something that happens later on. So this was a dream from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It was a wahi that he was receiving, receiving this way. Now there's a hadith that actually talks about that. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said there will be no more prophets after after me, but uh, a good dream of a believer will be 146th part of the prophethood. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Some of the scholars, they say, because this is same, uh, and they refer to it as this. Rasulullah so received those dreams prior to becoming a prophet for six months. They were the true dreams. And then, after that, the revelation came down to him for about 23 years. Okay? So 23 years have how many six months? 46 six months. So they say that this is where it's coming from. The hadith is referring to that because this is the 146, because the dream that is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a good dream, or good, uh, that is part of the Prophet. Does not mean we're talking about there's a new Prophet coming in or something after the Sulaqan. This is not referred as, as a revelation. It doesn't mean that we need more addition to the Islam or something. Islam is completed uh, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, uh, uh, and is preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is, that what we have is uh, sufficient for us. Okay? So if somebody sees a dream or something, it is nothing to add to the revelation when we talk about uh, adding to the Islam, something new from the dreams. Okay, then uh, Rasulullah Sam in that time, he started loving, uh, as I said, uh, uh, that he started loving that isolation. Okay, so he, 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 would, uh, he would do that. And then he, he used to go in seclusion in the cave of Hira, and he would stay there, he'd take his uh, food or water and stuff like that for him. And he would stay there as, as long as the food and the water uh, 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 was there. And then once he runs out of them, then he would come back to Khadija radiallahu anha at that time. And if, if, he, if he would take more or whatever the situation is. But this is what he used to do at that time uh, prior to become a prophet. And then the hadith says that uh, uh, and then it says, حَتَّى جَاءُوا الْحَفْظُهُ فِي غَارِ حِرَى فَجَاءُوا الْمَلَكْ فَقَالَ إِطْرَى Then, then what well, incident happened. And a malak, meaning that Jibreel came, and he said, إِطْرَى And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
he says, Ma'ana Bakari, that he says, I am not the one who recites. Now, some of the scholars of the Tafsir, they say, well, see, when Rasulullah is saying, Ma'ana Bakari, that I don't recite, it means it was shown to him something to read. And his response was, well, and I'm a I, I am not the one who recites, so I cannot recite. And for that, uh, uh, the hadith says, Rasulullah added the angel caught me forcefully. Okay? And he pressed. Okay? So, so that I could not bear it anymore, then he would release. And then he said, I'll get the qarab. And Rasulullah again repeated, repeated that, and I'm a that I'm not the one who recites. And he did that three times, that is squeezing him, and after the release, after the third time, then Rasulullah, then he said, Qarab ismi rabbika ladhi khala 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 insana min Allah. And he continued on the first, first five verses of Surah Allah. And uh, for that, Rasulullah Wasallam, at that time, he started reciting. Now, that incident really scared Rasulullah Wasallam. And he was, uh, as the hadith says, I'm not making it up from my own thing, the hadith of Rasulullah Wasallam, which is mentioned in Bukhari and other places as well, it says, فَرَجَعَ بِحَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ Okay, so he was shaken. It was uh, the heart was beating, and he came and فَدَخَلَ عَلَى خَدِيجَةً بِنْتِ خُوَيْلَةً رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَى فَقَالَ زَمِّلُونِ زَمِّلُونِ This is the, uh, the, the, the expression you might have all heard. زَمِّلُونِ زَمِّلُونِ And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asking to be covered, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and a regular person would also be um, thinking the same way, right? That you're sitting here and suddenly someone, something pops up, some new person comes in. Or not only a new person, a Jibreel or, or, or an angel, a different creation is the one that comes in front of you. So you will be also, okay, well, what's happening to me? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi went, and he said to, uh, uh, after he was calmed down, and he said, لَقَدْ خَشِيدُوا عَلَى نَفْسِي That I am, I am, I am scared of my, my, myself, that uh, uh, what's happening to me? And this is what he said to Khadija. Khadija, she replied in a very beautiful way to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amazing words that you hear. And uh, this, these are some kind of amazing words you hear about Abu Bakr Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. When he was trying to leave Mecca at one point, and one of the Meccans came, the Kuffar, and he said pretty much similar things to Abu Bakr as well about the kind of person Abu Bakr was. And her response was, well, that, Wallahi ma yuflif Allah wa ta'ala. That, by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to disgrace you. So don't think that Allah is going to disgrace you. And then she continued, by Allah will never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your kith and kin, help the poor and the destitute, serve your guests generously and assist the deserving calamity afflicted ones, right? So this is how Rasulullah Sallallahu was prior to becoming a prophet. Now, prior to becoming a prophet, he was like that. The question should be asked is, why was he, uh, he was, uh, he, he, he said, he was scared, fashidu nafsi. Now, you know, uh, I, you, you probably have heard this terminology called a long time when the brothers and the sisters, uh, they start learning about Islam and they want to do the da'wah da of Islam to the people as well. And uh, of course people make mistakes when they are doing that. Uh, we are, none of us is like a, we're not the one who are prophet or ma'asum in carrying the da'wah. Uh, ma'asum means infallible. We, we will make mistakes. We make mistakes as humans. The point to understand here is, um, which is sometimes said that, well, you know, a person should not be doing the da'wah until he reached a time, point like as Rasulullah was referred to as Sadiq al Amin. Yeah? Look, he was a Sadiq al Amin prior to becoming a prophet. And we better have a personality like that before we start carrying the da'wah to the people. This is kind of an interesting way of saying things. You have to just think about what are we saying when we say that? Did Rasulullah become a Sadiq al Amin because he was preparing himself to be a Prophet of Allah? He did not know. Because Allah is the one who chose him to be a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And that's one aspect of it. Second is, there is no way any one of us can say that we have reached the level of Rasulullah and now we've got to do the da'wah of Islam. There's no way. He is the one who was a messenger of Allah. He is the one who was infallible in carrying the message of Islam. And he was a prophet of Allah, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a Mustafa, Mushtaba, the one who was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do the job, right? So, uh, and Hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, uh, 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 that take the words, take, go and convey this message, even if it's one ayah. Of course, the one ayah that you understand what the ayah is. Okay. So now, uh, going back, uh, back to the subject, and uh, it seems like I'm not going to go into detail of the verses, but we'll talk about the hadith at least. There was about this uh, 
45 verses. So Khadija radiallahu anha, she took, she said, uh, she took Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Waraqa bin Nawfal bin Asad uh, bin Abdul Awsul. So he was the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha. And he was already became a Christian in the days of Jahiliyyah. And he used to write in Jeel, or in Jeel is the word for Bible. Yeah? He used to write Bible during those days to translate them and uh, 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 with Hebrew letters. So he became a Christian and used to write the writing with Hebrew letters. And he, uh, he was very old now, he became blind even. So when uh, Khadija took to Rasulullah uh, to Baraka bin Nawfal, and uh, she said, فَقَالَهُ خَدِيجَ يَا إِبْنَ عَمْ إِسْمَعْ مِنْ إِبْنَ أَخِيْ Listen to, your, uh, uh, to the son of your brother. I'm talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Akhik uh, does not necessarily mean he was the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But rather it's a way of saying that. Yeah? So he was a nephew. We were going to listen to uh, your nephew, oh my cousin. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started explaining to him what happened to him, uh, now listen to his response was that uh, he said هذا الناموس الذي نزل الله على موسى صلى الله عليه وسلم الله عليه وسلم that he said this is the same ناموس ناموس is a word used for an angel angel Jibreel that was uh, 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 he's the one who used to give the uh, uh, secrets to uh, موسى عليه الصلاة والسلام and يا ليتني فيها جابر عن يا ليت ليتني أكون حيا إذ يخرجك قوم and he said that I wish that I will be strong enough when your nation is going to make you leave your land. Okay, and that was surprising for Rasulullah Sallallahu This is just the first view I had to reveal and somebody is breaking the news. You know what, the, the, the track you are on, the path you are on, that you are becoming a Sallallahu Alaihi this was going to happen. Your people are going to make you leave your land. And he was, uh, he asked uh, that they are going to, to, to make me leave or drive me out of my land. And the response of Waraka was that any man who came with something similar to what you have brought was treated with hostility and I should remind, if I remain alive till the day when you will be turned out, then I would support you strongly. Okay, and after that, few days after that, Waraka uh, passed away. Uh, and uh, the, the Wahi was, was close, the doors of Wahi were closed for, uh, for a few days. Oh, closed means they were paused. Uh, and this is something also we'll inshallah talk about further later on. Okay, um, now talking about, okay, I seem like I, the site is missing. Now, uh, 346. I don't think I can go into the detail of this, these verses right now, but I want to give the background of these verses, and inshallah we'll talk about the verses uh, starting from uh, verse number one and then continue on next week, inshallah. If there's any questions or comments about the subject covered, inshallah, I'll try to answer them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, you mentioned that the prophets are masoom and infallible. What's the evidence for uh, all prophets being infallible, uh, and is there a difference of opinion on it? No, the Isma. When we talk about that, uh, uh, there are uh, <coughs> there are there many. Uh, there's a verse that actually talks about Allah Yasmuka. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's going to be protecting you. That talks about the asma, actually says that's a protection mark. Yeah? Protection physically. And because of that, after physical, uh, uh, because Rasulullah so used to have even guards in the beginning. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that uh, Allah will protect him, then he removed the guards. But besides that, uh, uh, there is no difference of opinion when it comes to the issue or the subject of. Uh, uh, the prophets being masoom because they are directed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Uh, uh, sometimes some people will go into the extent of they try to make him masoom in every regard. But the thing is, that is about only the wahi. If you go into detail of that, the, the, the message that they carry, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one that. Uh, 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 protects us. I'm trying to remember. So, to ask a question, Rabbi Kala, 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 Rabbi Kala,
Rasulullah that he is the one who will be protecting this message. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nahnu in inna nawla hafidhu, that we are the one who will reveal this dhikr, and we are the one who will be protecting uh, this uh, dhikr, which is the Quran. And uh, when Quran means the Sunnah of Rasulullah as well. And actually, you can take it an extent to the point some scholars they do it to, to the language itself, because without the language, you cannot understand the Quran either. So, uh, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken this dhimma, uh, uh, the, the, the responsibility on him that he will be the one who will be protecting this message. Okay? Um, Any other question? I can, I can provide you more if you need. There's an uh, abundance of uh, evidence in the box of it. Very good. Okay. Stop here. Zakamullah Khairan. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashidu Allah ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa tuwadik. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah.